Welcome to AI Village. The next talk is It's a Beautiful Day in the Malware Neighborhood by Matt. And uh, basically, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Endgame, Silence, Sophos, and Tinder. And of course, silence your cell phones. And if you have an open seat next to you, please raise your hand so the people next to you or people coming in can know there's a seat. Thanks. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, even though Silence is a sponsor, don't worry, this isn't a sponsored talk. Um, this tool is completely open source. Um, so again, my name is Matt Mazel. I'm the manager of security data science at Silence. Um, and uh, specifically today, I'm going to be talking about the use of nearest neighbor search techniques um, applied to malware similarity, specifically in a tool called Rogers um, that's uh, open source on GitHub right now. I have a, a feature branch that I'm working on some updates from the content today that I'll present. Uh, but this tool is designed for malware analysts and security data scientists to perform malware similarity research. So just some motivation. Um, so building databases of our malware is, uh, is interesting for, for analysts and for data scientists. So search and retrieval of similar samples you know, can provide valuable context to analysts and systems. The uh, objective uh, um, in this case is to basically build a database, index our malware by some attribute or some set of attributes and when we have some unknown sample, uh, query that database and hopefully if we've ever seen a similar sample, uh, we get back valuable context, you know, maybe other labeled uh, samples, maybe samples that have been reversed and we have you know, a lot of details on. Um, so that's use case kind of number one for these systems. Uh, use case number two is, you know, if, if so a sample that we've never seen before and it also doesn't match anything in our, in our corpus. You know, we can prioritize that uh, for manual analysis or maybe more, uh, more advanced reverse engineering. Finally, kind of the, uh, the final use case of search and retrieval systems for malware similarity is to uh, augment uh, uh, larger systems, maybe doing clustering or maybe doing classification. So we can use nearest neighbor search techniques to uh, basically process incoming alerts and leverage any sample, any hits that we get back with the context to determine if we want to route that sample to other workflows in our environment. Um, historically, this of course has been done in you know, big databases of cryptographic hashes, uh, fuzzy hashing, notably SSDeep is also uh, kind of a, a standard approach still and still de facto I'd argue. So how does this relate to nearest neighbor search? So you know, if we consider malware similarity as being performed through comparison of raw bytes or extracted static and dynamic features that distill the semantic characteristics, um, we can take these features and represent them in this n-dimensional feature space. And with that, we can feed that into a lot of nearest neighbor search algorithms, um, and as, as well as other machine learning algorithms as well too. Um, so nearest neighbor search, simply put, is the task of uh, being given a set of samples X, so our, our corpus, um, basically take a query sample, our unknown sample XQ, and uh, query the index and basically get back the K nearest neighbors um, according to some distance function. And there's you know, many different uh, distance functions that can be used here. A gentleman earlier today mentioned Euclidean. You know, we can use cosine. Uh, we can even use other, other metrics like string metrics that uh, operate on, on edit distance or Levenstein distance. Um, and ultimately, um, nearest neighbor search, of course, uh, is hard at scale you know, with a high dimensional space. So we have to look at approximate variants of this that allow some error threshold epsilon and uh, basically uh, kind of bounds our true distance whenever we query our index. And uh, just again as a really simple example here, if uh, this kind of two dimensional space here is if we query this red dot here, uh, the uh, K nearest neighbor for three would be these three samples in the inner circle. Um, if there is maybe a, if this is maybe an approximate um, variant, you know, might, there might be a chance that we could accidentally return uh, some of these samples in the larger kind of radius here. So um, don't worry, I don't have any algorithms, but um, I actually cut out a lot of this. But there's a lot of interesting theory and literature um, around nearest neighbor search, you know, over the past uh, several decades. Um, I kind of categorize them specifically in three different areas. So there's tree-based methods, you know, where we're basically partitioning our data set into, you know, these these cells in our in our uh, feature space. So we use tree data structures to exploit uh, that nature and basically rapidly look up and uh, identify the cell, um, kind of uh, shown here in this case here, still in a two-dimensional space. We use a, a tree data structure to quickly look up and uh, identify nearest neighbors in this particular cell. Um, there's also hashing nearest neighbor uh, methods as well too, you know, where we're, we're typically in this case applying a non-cryptographic hash that kind of has this property of, you know, ensuring that any small input or any small change in the input space only results in a small change in the output space. So the idea is here we're actually looking for collisions between similar objects. Um, in this case, uh, we, we can come up with different hashing algorithms. Uh, locality sensitive hashing is one kind of popular one where the whole idea is uh, to find uh, hashing functions that take some input, so some input sample 
variable, in this case represented by our feature vector, um, and if we hash it, we ultimately want to end up in the same bucket or end up with the same hash code if it's similar. And then again, ultimately this determines, uh, it, it reduces the number of candidates in this case that end up in the same bucket, uh, ultimately to actually do uh, distance comparisons on. Because doing, you know, again, doing like pairwise distance is super expensive and, and no one wants to do that. Finally, a, a kind of more recent, uh, a really more recent approach for nearest neighbor search is uh, graph based methods. Um, so the general idea here is that we're going to build these proximity graphs, uh, maybe several layers of graphs that we kind of stack together. Um, and we have uh, algorithms that basically uh, do an initial kind of offline phase of building our graph and connect to the neighbors uh, and with these edges based off of their similarity. Um, and then uh, ultimately at query time we kind of end up in uh, one part of the graph and navigate around, um, basically traverse our graph, potentially traverse multiple layers and build up our candidate set for comparison. Um, the, the downside here is that a lot of the graphing algorithms are extremely expensive. You know, we have to basically find specific types of graphs when we do our build, our offline build phase uh, that make them uh, easy to search through and traverse through in a, a short amount of time. So, um, there's a crap ton of methods out there. Um, I highly recommend uh, checking out this uh, ANN benchmarks page. It's on uh, GitHub. There's a paper associated with all too. Um, every uh, so often, uh, this developer reruns all the latest and greatest uh, implementations of these various nearest neighbor search methods uh, across a wide variety of uh, data sets for benchmarking. Um, and kind of the, the typical benchmark that's used here is uh, this trade off between queries per second, so how fast can we look up items, to uh, the recall. Uh, and in this case, the recall is the fraction of the true nearest neighbors returned in our search. So the kind of general idea here is that, you know, up and to the right is better, but you can kind of see uh, usually there's this trade off of, hey, we can query our, our index for nearest neighbors very quickly. Again, if this is like in a, a large production system, but we get that at the expense of having really low recall. Uh, conversely, if we, you know, really want a high recall, basically re we want our approximate methods to bring back the exact results, you know, we, we typically trade that off at the cost of queries per second. Now one, uh, one algorithm to kind of point out here, and I'll, I'll get into in a bit, is this uh, HNSW, or Hierarchical Navigable Small World. Um, so that's this, uh, uh, that's this line right here, so it, it does fairly well. And again, this is just one example of this New York Times data set for K equals 100. Um, if you go back to their site, you'll see that it actually does fairly well across a large, a wide variety of data sets, and uh, also uh, does well at varying levels of K, uh, varying levels of K. So, hence, uh, kind of why uh, that's one of the algorithms that I specifically picked uh, to look at and uh, you know use the implementation in Rogers for malware similarity. So, this method was uh, recently created in 2017. Again, it's based on a, a lot of uh, different algorithms and graph uh, graph nearest neighbor search. But the the basic idea at a high level is uh, basically construct this multi-layer graph. Um, and use it to greedily identify candidates uh, for comparison. So as I kind of alluded to in my overview slide, you know, there's this phase where we construct this graph, um, we query the candidates through this traversal mechanism, and then iteratively search neighboring nodes until some cro stopping criteria is met. So HNSW defines all that, all the uh, kind of methods there for the stopping criteria for the way that we build the graph, and ultimately uh, kind of just to sketch this out here, um, after we've built this graph consisting of multiple layers, uh, so it's really multiple layers of graphs, you know, we, uh, set different parameters for this algorithm to determine how frequently, basically how deep a sample ends up in one of these layers. Um, I, sh I should say how uh, shallow. So it, we basically start from the top layer here going down to the bottom layer. But the idea at query time is uh, once we've constructed these, uh, these layers of graphs, we start at some point here, uh, navigate, in this case there's only one sample, so it basically searches the neighborhood, goes right to the sample, eventually reaches a, a local minimum here because there's no other neighbors to look for, and then drops down to the next layer. And it kind of this, this process process continues until eventually we get to the final layer. Um, and th this is also can be tuned as well to at query time to determine how deep into the layers of grass we'd like to go. But ultimately this results in, again, uh, kind of this paper based, uh, bases the, this approach and uh, basically ensures that any samples that we visit across all the layers are likely to be nearest neighbors. Um, and that's ultimately what we use to determine the number of candidates that we end up querying, or sorry, end up uh, doing a comparison against uh, with our query. So that's a, that's a graph based method. Um, so there's an also another really recent method too that uh, I actually caught at um, the uh, NIPS workshop, uh, a, a, basically a machine learning research conference uh, back uh, last fall. It's really interesting. Um, so it's called Prioritized Dynamic Continuous Indexing or, or PDCI. And there's an earlier iteration of this just called Dynamic Continuous Indexing as well too. 
Um, so the authors here actually design an exact randomized algorithm, um, and it's built around this idea that we're going to avoid partitioning samples by vector space. Um, so kind of going back to this example with the tree-based methods where we're kind of splitting up our feature space along the, uh, each feature, um, that gets, uh, that basically has a lot of issues. And uh, PDCI, uh, the authors noticed that, you know, what we can do is just build these indices and basically uh, take our samples and project them along a random direction. And we do this so we can control the number of indices we want to build to basically determine uh, how well this, uh, this method actually works. Um, and the idea is we construct multiple indices and the kind of, the main gist is that as you visit the indices and uh, uh, you query the index, you end up at a place where you're, you're basically your query is projected to. Um, any of the samples that are nearby, uh, either uh, in this case that are larger or smaller, uh, you, you kind of pop those samples off and if they end up appearing in all indices, um, again, this paper kind of shows that uh, that's highly likely to be the exact nearest neighbors. Um, so you add that to the candidate set for comparison. Um, and again, this, uh, this is particularly interesting uh, because uh, in this, uh, specifically within this exact uh, nearest neighbor search method, uh, some of the guarantees in this paper are, uh, are pretty, pretty compelling. And unfortunately though, because it's uh, an academic uh, paper, I mean, the author is uh, a, pretty well, a very well respected PhD student, I think, uh, at Berkeley, um, but there's no open source implementation yet. So I went ahead and tried to do a naive implementation in, in Rogers uh, specifically. So that's uh, PDCI. Uh, again, these two algorithms are the ones that kind of uh, I focus on right now for the, this talk. So other, other malware similarity systems, um, you know, there, there's quite a few that have different approaches to doing this uh, for nearest neighbor search or just similarity in general. So of course VirusTotal um, has different uh, ways to index data, um, also using SSD, um, but also a, a, a clustering, uh, uh, basically a clustering API that is based off of feature hashing of the static, uh, from my understanding from the, their docs, uh, from the structural data pulled out from static feature extraction. Um, and th this is actually where I source uh, some of my, my data sets for evaluation of these methods, which uh, you'll soon see to, it's uh, to my detriment, unfortunately. Um, our very own uh, Brian Wallace, uh, one of the, uh, the AI Village uh, uh, core team members, actually came up with a blog, uh, wrote a blog post in Virus Bulletin a few years back um, that basically exploited the, uh, the way that the SSD message digest is built um, to uh, eliminate the number of comparisons needed. Um, and then more recently, uh, you know, again, you, you can take this idea and, and basically apply it to Elastic Search as well too, so you can just use an off-the-shelf database um, to actually use the same uh, kind of uh, method here for indexed SSD. Um, so again, that's using uh, one of the similarity digest methods that's kind of in the, in the uh, bigger, larger group, I should say, of hashing-based nearest neighbor methods. Um, and then of course there's kind of the popular uh, academic implementations of malware similarity systems. So BitShred is uh, highly cited um, back in 2011. So it uses pairwise Jacquard similarity and it uses Hadoop to do that. So it gets, it's, again, fully pairwise. So it's very expensive, hence the need for Hadoop. Um, there's also the malware provenance system, which is a little bit more recent, um, that uh, uses minhash, a type of the, uh, uh, basically an LSH family, a, a locality sensitive hashing family that um, approximates um, Jacquard similarity. Um, so that's, that's used uh, across a sliding window of n-gram features on disassembled samples. Um, and the, yeah, those are the two, uh, yeah, two final ones here. Um, there's also a uh, Malheur, uh, which focuses more on the behavioral uh, feature similarity comparison, specifically for uh, Cuckoo. Um, it's a, there's a, a lot of different capabilities built in there for clustering and also classification, but uh, underneath the hood there's this uh, kind of use of uh, looking at behavior features for doing uh, prototype identification or prototype selection. Um, so you can basically identify prototypes, um, you know, that are in a large cluster, pretty much like the, the centroid around these points and uh, use that for a, a way to quickly do comparison. And then uh, there's also the SARVAM, which uh, kind of takes some uh, computer vision ideas from uh, basically indexing images and uh, takes a binary as raw bytes and basically uh, converts it into a grayscale image and then indexes that. Um, so there's, there's a handful of systems out there. There's a lot of algorithms to kind of choose from, again, that have a, a lot of different uh, properties, uh, again, with that kind of going back to the, the performance metric there of query uh, by recall. Um, so when we're approaching uh, the design of the system to do malware similarity and specifically uh, use that system to evaluate different nearest neighbor search techniques, you know, I, I kind of define these four uh, key design, uh, the design ideas. So number one, you know, of course we have to extract and store sample metadata um, from our raw features. Um, we have to then transform uh, that feature, uh, transform that raw data into, you know, some feature representation again in this n-dimensional feature space. And we might have a variety of different vectorization pipelines that we want to experiment with. 
uh, talks earlier today mentioned a, a few uh, TFIDF. Um, you know, I, I use feature hashing specifically in my more recent approach. Um, so we might want to kind of change out that vectorization pipeline depending on you know what we want to evaluate and what features we want to include, um, and also how large our data set might be. Um, so after we transform our, our features with one of these pipelines, we then fit um, you know the, the different nearest neighbor methods and you know do some bookkeeping. Maybe you have to save some, uh, basically save some of the database structures that are required, um, and that's kind of the fit stage. Um, and finally, once we fit all these indices, you know we want to actually query samples and then uh, basically again kind of ch pick the parameter k to determine how many nearest neighbors we're going to pull back. And then possibly if we have this this database of sample metadata, we also might want to display uh, the contextual features maybe. Again, we have some uh, uh, case database of previous uh, incidences in our environment, and we want to annotate our samples that we pull back with some of that. And it might help for uh, more of the analyst context uh, kind of thing. Um, so that really gives us, um, uh, or really what I kind of came up with is this design then for for Rogers. Uh, uh, Rogers is a Python three application um, that you know pretty much has a a, a sample class. Um, in this case, it's it's really only a sample class consisting of the PE class. Um, that really only focuses on really basic uh, static feature extraction using PE file. Um, but it, it's built in a way that you could ex expand uh, the number of sample classes if you again bring in you know, other things other than just portable executables. Um, vec vectorizer, so there's a, a, a basically a scikit-learn pipeline APIs I pretty much use extensively. And in this case right now I have a latent semantic analysis which again uh, earlier talk kind of uses some of those ideas with the TF-IDF um, and then projecting down. And then uh, more recently, just because I started getting into data sets that were a little bit larger um, to handle, I, I started looking at feature hashing approaches, you know, and um, this basically can be extended with anything supported by scikit-learn or other vectorizers as well too. And then uh, finally, the, the kind of final component here is this index class, you know, which uh, in this case I have implementations or I, I use uh, libraries for like uh, HNSW or I use the LSH for us in scikit-learn which uh, is going to be deprecated anyway here soon. Um, but then I have an implementation for index SSDeep and PDCI, and it pretty much at this point uses uh, SQLite, you know, as the the store for at least the uh, index SSDeep and the PDCI uh, methods. Um, all of the feature data too is uh, I forgot to mention is uh, stored in uh, in Protobuf, a, a message definition that has um, basically a kind of a structure that allows you to add different modalities of, of features. Um, so you can add static features, dynamic features, contextual features, and then uh, give them uh, if if you want to, you can give that a, a variable type um, if you'd like to actually automatically build like uh, feature vectorizers later on. But um, again, that's not really not really supported yet in the vectorizer class. Cool. So now, unfortunately, to the sad panda part of my talk. Um, so yeah, uh, doing these types of experiments and getting data sets, you know, for doing malware similarity is difficult. Um, unfortunately, I, I didn't really get as much time on doing this experiments as I wanted to. Um, what we're looking at here again is uh, we have two charts. Um, so this chart right here is this recall at k for exact nearest neighbor. So at the on the x, x axis we have the number of k's that we picked um, for each of the uh, experiments, and then on the left on the y axis here is the recall. Again, this is the fraction of the true uh, nearest neighbors returned uh, for the query. Um, on this side right here, we have precision at k for for neighborhood class. So this is actually more of a so same kind of metric where we're looking at the relevant documents over the k or the uh, the total relevant uh, sorry relevant over the total number of uh, relevant documents in our data set. In this case, um, I'm actually just uh, using the class uh, for the samples to basically say, hey, if if I query the sample and I get back all, all my results in my query are all the same class, you know, because I have labels for them, um, you know, that indicates to me we have high precision at k. Um, so if you look at this, it does very well for the, these samples, and I kind of I'll illustrate this in a sec. Uh, you'll kind of see why. But um, that actual exact nearest neighbor results are, are pretty bad. Um, you know, we have 0.3 for PDCI, and then uh, HNSW kind of is, is you know pretty low. And again, I, I did parameter selection, or I did, I did uh, some grid search, you know, for parameters for each of these methods, and tried to come up with things. But I really couldn't get anywhere. And um, you know, just to kind of highlight this again, this is this data set's coming from the VT clustering data set with 25, 27,000 samples and 15 classes. Um, so cool. So a uh, quick demo time to kind of illustrate, um, you know, at least the interface. So Rogers is exposed as a command line application. So if you want to use it on the CLI, you can. Um, but I also have uh, APIs exposed to to basically uh, make it so that you can import uh, import Rogers and then build an index. And then I use Plotly in this case just to visualize some of the results. Um, so I'll blow this up a little bit real quick. 
like I said, still probably hard to see in the back, but um, the idea here is that I've, I've previously fit an index, um, this one specifically HNSW, and um, again, I have some kind of standard APIs here for uh, passing in a sample, set, setting the number of K, getting back the neighbors. Um, and in this case, uh, if we clear this, you know, we can see we get back the sample. Here's the, the query sample, just kind of, again, doing some print statements here just to make it easy to see what we're getting back. Um, then here's the nearest neighbors. And, you know, again, they're, look, I mean, look how similar these are. This is cosine similarity. Um, the, the graph here just kind of displays them. And if we look at some of the, uh, the kind of features here, so here's the query sample. You know, we can see that this is uh, with the Lamer label. Um, and we look at some of these other samples. It's re, re, uh, reg run. Um, there's another one, too. I mean, yeah, totally different. So the, the labels themselves are different. Um, and what I kind of realized after getting into this is that given the fact that my feature space is limited to the static uh, feature extraction methods, you know, and uh, given that, you know, we're really only uh, looking at samples that are usually, I think a lot of these are just like packed samples, everything really looks identical. Um, so I think that kind of might explain why I had really bad results um, and kind of uh, illustrates the need to, for me to get better data sets uh, for evaluation here. Um, so just for a little bit bonus, um, so Zori was uh, released at Black Hat, um, and because of the frustration I had with some of the feature extraction around the basic static stuff, I went ahead and implemented a Zori, vec uh, Zori feature extraction class uh, for PE, and uh, you know, just in this case, I only got to pulling out a bag of words for the mnemonics. Um, so that's just kind of an example of uh, for this particular sample running Zori on it. I was able to do run this on like 500 samples or so and build a, a, a vectorizer. And again, now we can uh, rerun uh, rerun the uh, same query with. I'm sorry, d this is a different sample. We can now leverage the uh, the bag of word um, mnemonics uh, as well, in addition to the other kind of static uh, features that are pulled out, and it, it gives us slightly different results. Again, I haven't uh, really done any uh, formal comparison of these these methods. So um, this kind of wraps up stuff, I think. Um, but the uh, the general idea here, you know, is that. Rogers is a tool for one, experimenting with near, different nearest neighbor search techniques, um, but also is a tool to build out vectorizers for the different methods. Uh, similarity, you know, doing similarity uh, in your environment might depend, you know, you might have different use cases. You might only want to do static comparison. You might only want to do dynamic. You might want to do both. Um, you might want to, you know, apply like an automated disassembler like Zori on it. Um, there's clearly, uh, at least in the vectorizers that I published with this tool, um, you know, there's, it's very limited to uh, kind of just PE, um, and there's definitely opportunity for different modalities. Um, there's also opportunities for doing feature selection and learning representations as well, too, to come up with a better feature space um, that could be used for similarity comparison. Um, for experiments, uh, definitely in my case, uh, you know, I did run some parameter optimization, but unfortunately just need to get more data sets for doing benchmarks. Um, and also uh, I think it would be interesting to evaluate different distance metrics, you know, beyond just Euclidean uh, for some of this and basically use that to determine, uh, uh, again, similarity for some of these methods. Um, and, and again, some of these methods, uh, like HNSW by default uses cosine, um, but like PDCI is Euclidean. And finally, uh, more use cases. So, so potentially, in this case, you know, we're only indexing malware samples, uh, but you could also potentially index benign samples as well too. And of course, like the the key is being able to, con to continuously update the index with new samples as they come in and have been uh, classified or been analyzed. Um, so, doing uh, like a partial fit or like an insert operation uh, would be pretty easy to extend as well too. Cool. Um, so this point for questions. So again, uh, this, this tool is up on GitHub. I, I do have a feature branch. I apologize. I got to get it out. Uh, it's just, uh, it's just been crazy the past week. So that this feature branch will add uh, feature hashing, will add the PDCI, um, and basically uh, publish the experiment. Uh, again, I, I do feel that the experimental results were pretty weak, but maybe could be explained just by the data set I was using. Uh, certainly it would be kind of interesting to experiment more. Um, so yeah, and pull requests are welcome. Any, uh, any questions at all? Sorry, go. Can you show the vectorizers? Yeah, so I guess uh, Zori, because I, I was kind of experimenting with this. Right here, so this is a, a signature vectorizer. So this one is actually using the Yara rules repo. Um, so I just use the Yara uh, detections as features themselves and, uh, and kind of try to figure out like what, Yara, in, in this case, apply TDF, TD, TF, TF IDF to determine like what uh, signatures are more uh, useful compared to others. Go ahead. Oh, so yeah, in this case, there really isn't any feature selection um, other than applying like TF IDF and then projecting down. 
Any final questions? I'm sorry, I can't, uh, I can't hear you at all. I, I apologize, I still can't hear you. Oh. Oh, so uh, the metrics on the distance, cal uh, so yeah, as I mentioned, HN HNSW uses cosine, um, the uh, PDCI is using Euclidean, um, but the metrics are just this, uh, this recall at K, so basically I, I do exact nearest neighbor search on my data set um, just using brute force, and I compute that for Euclidean, and I compute that for cosine, and then uh, those are like kind of the, uh, basically the ground truth that I use in this case for this recall at K for the nearest, uh, sorry, for the exact neighbors. Yeah, so uh, I mentioned like, you know, I, I don't, don't do any feature learning, don't do any of that kind of stuff. Um, and I also think that, you know, going beyond some of the basic static features would, would definitely, obviously change the results significantly. Um, so I hope to do that in the future. Oh, sorry, didn't see you. Right. Yeah, so um, just a little background. So the question is, uh, you know, do more experiments pretty much. Experiments are fun. Sometimes they're, they're sad, but, you know, it's always got to push forward. So the next one, the other question was, like, what, what did I learn kind of doing this implementation? Uh, it was definitely really a lot of fun to do the PDCI implementation. Uh, again, it's really naive in Python 3 uh, using... Uh, using SQLite uh, basically to, to store those indices. So uh, it was great to have a chance to kind of go through a paper that, again, has no published source code, you know, um, and then uh, base, or no published implementation for reference, and then uh, try to do that. Um, and then, yeah, a lot of, a lot of Python 3 uh, kind of things I picked up during this project as well. Yeah, there's not, the, so those algorithms don't do any feature engineering, they don't do any feature selection, you basically pass in you know, your, your feature vector into index. So that's kind of a, a pre-processing step, in this case here, which I did at the vectorization phase. Cool, um, thanks everyone.